Hi, today I'm going to talk about how I approach the evaluation of a knee MRI. The knee MRI usually have five sequences. It will be one axial image, which is usually a proton density with fat suppression. Um, then we have two sagittal images. One is going to be a proton density without fat suppression, and the second is going to be either a T2 with fat suppression or also a proton density with fat suppression. And then we have two coronal images. Most people will do a coronal T1 uh, with no fat suppression. And then the other one will be a proton density with fat suppression or a T2 with fat suppression. Most people will do a proton density with fat suppression. So you have a proton density both in coronal and in sagittal. And that way you can evaluate the meniscus in both uh, the body as well as the posterior horn and the anterior horn. The way that I approach musculoskeletal MRIs is that I first evaluate the bones and joints, then the ligaments and tendons, and finally the soft tissues. In the knee, I add the menisci because they are really important to evaluate and a lot of people have meniscal tears and that's the reason to have knee pain. So I'm gonna just go through the way I look at an MRI, taking into consideration that I first evaluate the bone and joint, then the ligaments and tendons, then the menisci, and then the soft tissue. So I jump from sequence to sequence. Uh, some people may go through the axial images and evaluate everything that there is to see in the axial images and then go to the sagittals and then the coronals. But I kind of jump around because I go through um, kind of structures. So the first thing that I do is that I go through the uh, coronal T1 and the reason why this is the first sequence that I see is for several reasons. The first one is that I want to have a general idea about the bone marrow, make sure there are no gross large abnormalities in the bone marrow. The second is that I want to see the growth plates and uh, that's because I want to know if I'm dealing with a pediatric patient or an adult patient and I'm just trying to see if the growth plates are completely closed or not. And then the last thing is that I want to have a general idea of how much the generation is in the knee. Um, if I cannot divide evaluating a knee joint, if there's a lot of degeneration, I'm dealing with meniscal tears, chondromalacia, and everything related to the generation, or not if it's an athlete or somebody with acute pain or trauma. So I'm looking at the femoral condyles to look for osteophytes and grossly evaluating the joint spaces. And with the coronal T1, I just kind of get a gross idea of what's going on. Then I start my search pattern. I start with the bone and joint, and here I start with the axial images. And in the axial images, what I'm looking for is to see if there's any effusion at the suprapatellar recess or at the medial or lateral patellar recess, see if there's any fluid or synovitis. Because I'm looking at the bone and joint, I'm also always looking at the bone marrow. I already saw it on the T1, but I want to make sure now in the proton density with fat suppression that there is no uh, bone marrow edema or something that I need to worry about. That is not in the subchondral bone, which I would likely evaluate that better in the coronal images. Then I look at the patella and the patellar cartilage, the lateral patellar facet, the patellar apex, and the medial patellar facet, making sure that there are no cartilage defects or abnormalities. I also evaluate the non-weight bearing uh, cartilage of the femoral condyles in the axial images. It's a good sequence to evaluate for that. To finalize my search in the axial images for the bone and joint, I look at the proximal tibiofibular articulation. This is the fourth compartment of the knee joint. A lot of people say tricompartmental degeneration, but some think that there is actually four compartments and the fourth is the proximal tibiofibular articulation. And I take a look at it because I'm in bone and joints in the axial image to make sure that there's no effusion or any abnormality to this fourth compartment of the knee joint. And after this, I will jump to the coronal images in proton density or T2 with fat suppression. And here I'm looking at the cartilage, again, the weight-bearing femoral condyle cartilage and the tibial cartilage. And I'm again looking at the bone marrow. And here I do look at the subchondral bone, making sure there are no subchondral cysts that may suggest some kind of chondromalacia that is not clearly seen as a cartilage defect. And finally, I go to the 
uh, sagittal images with fat suppression, either a T2 or a proton density. And again, I'm looking at the cartilage, uh, at the weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing femoral condyles. And here, I look again for effusion at the suprapatellar recess. I'm also looking at the infrapatellar fat pad, which we also know as the Hoffa's fat pad, to make sure that there is no edema or any other abnormalities. So with that, I just finished the bone and joint search. Now I start with the evaluation of ligaments and tendons, and I usually start with the sagittal image with fat suppression, which is usually a, a proton density or a T2. And here I look at the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, which should be uh, parallel to the Blumenstadt line or the intercondylar roof. And I also look at the posterior cruciate ligament to make sure it's intact in the sagittal image. Then I go to the quadriceps tendon, make sure it's intact. Usually it can have some striation as it is the confluence of four different muscles. I look at the patellar tendon, the other part of the extensor mechanism from the uh, patellar attachment to the tibial attachment, make sure there's no thickening or tear. Then after I see these four tendons and ligaments in the sagittal, I move to the axial image. In the axial images for ligaments and tendons, I again look at the quadriceps tendon and the patellar tendon, make sure there are of homogeneous low T T2 and T1 and proton density, signal intensity. I look at the retinaculum. The retinaculums are best seen on the axial images, the medial and lateral retinaculum, make sure they're taut and that they are of low signal intensity and not thickened. In ligaments and tendons, I again in the axial images look at the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament, and the PCL. Uh, sometimes in the sagittal images, you're not 100% convinced that it's okay, so you confirm in the axial and also the coronal images. So the ACL here with these two bands, anterior medial and posterior lateral, and the PCL, which is bigger. Then I evaluate the medial and lateral structures or supporting structures of the knee. In the medial side will be the MCL here, going from the femur to the tibia. Make sure it's thin, taut, and of normal signal intensity. On the lateral side, there's several structures, four of them. Uh, the biceps femoris, which inserts in the fibular head, the fibular collateral ligaments, which goes from the femur to the fibular head, then the iliotibial band, which is anteriorly. And finally, we evaluate the popliteus tendon as it originates in the popliteus hiatus and it goes posterior uh, to the knee joint. And we can see the muscle belly here, posterior to the tibia and the myotendinous junction. All those are uh, very well evaluated on the axial image. Also on the axial image, I like to evaluate the posterior lateral corner, uh, make sure that there is no abnormality in signal intensity, cyst, or any edema that may suggest there is injury to the posterior lateral corner. I also look at the posterior medial corner, uh, in particular the semimembranous and medial head of the gastronemius as they cross here. This is where a baker cyst would be, but make sure the tendons are all right. And then also the peasant serinus tendons, the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinous. And as I go down, make sure that there is no fluid underneath the insertion of the peasant serinus of these three tendons uh, to make sure that there is no bursitis. So this is what I look for in ligaments and tendons in the axial image. And finally, I go to the coronal image, the T2 or proton density with fat suppression. I again look at the MCL, make sure it looks fine for uh, I also look at the lateral ligamentous structures, the fibrocolateral uh, ligament here uh, that goes from the lateral femoral condyle to the fibular head, the tendon of the biceps femoris, and anteriorly we look at the iliotibial band. Those are the structures that we uh, see in the medial and lateral aspect of the knee on the coronal image. Then we again see the ACL with its two bands, anterior medial and posterior lateral and also the PCL, the ACL and PCL we see uh, very clearly on the axial, sagittal, and coronal, so we might as well take a look at it in all those sequences. So after this, I'm done with the ligaments and tendons. Um, so now I go to the menisci, and I start the menisci in the sagittal uh, 
proton density or T2 with fat suppression. Hopefully you have a proton density. And I just go from the roots, which is really important to evaluate all the way to the body and posterior and anterior horns. Make sure there's no signal abnormality. Uh, both the medial and lateral meniscus, uh, the, the medial tibial plateau is a little bit more concave. The lateral is a little bit more convex, just in case you're lost. But you can always go to the periphery and see the fibula, and now you know you're in the lateral tibial femoral compartment. Make sure you evaluate the roots of the meniscus very well, because a lot of the tears that people miss are usually in the roots. And then after this, I go to the coronal image again, and with fat suppression, and I look at the body of both the medial and lateral menisca and make sure that there is no tear. And I also evaluate in the menisco femoral and menisco tibial ligaments and the capsule of the meniscus, make sure that there is no abnormality or parameniscal cyst that may be hiding somewhere in there. Again, important, we go posteriorly and anteriorly to make sure that we can evaluate those roots and make sure we don't miss any tear there of the root. So after that, I go back to the axial images because then I'm going to the soft tissues and mainly I'm just trying to see that there is no Baker cyst. I evaluate the popliteal fossa as I don't want to miss any big lymph node or any aneurysm or a nerve abnormality here at the popliteal neurovascular bundle. I evaluate all the muscles that I see of the distal thigh, also the proximal leg to make sure that there is no edema or atrophy that may suggest uh, some type of nerve impingement. Then I go finally to the sagittal image, again with fat suppression and look at the soft tissues again, uh, all the muscles, the gastronemius, and make sure that there is no muscle atrophy or edema. And after that, I have finished my search pattern and produced my dictation. Well, thank you.